All right, so for this second lesson, we're going to look at the scriptural perspective on the subject at hand. Uh, I think many times we can speak about these things from uh, uh, an opinionated perspective, but the Bible says, sanctify them by that truth. John 17, 17, that word is truth. The reality is God's word. What is real, what exists, what actually is, is what is objectively the reality is God's word. And so if we want to understand a thing from truth, we have to look at God's perspective. And so God's opinion on the matter is what the truth is. And so let's look at, the, uh, let's look at what the scriptures say concerning Christians and our relationship with the secular world as far as friendship is concerned. We're going to be taking a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and at verse 14, 17, 18, James chapter 4 and verse 4, Psalms 1, 1, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, Jude 1, 23. So a lot of scriptures, but you'll bear with me in Jesus' name. So starting with 2 Corinthians 6, 14, the Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, remember the fellowship word again, hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? I think to understand the scripture, I should explain what being unequally yoked was. It was a term used, it was um, in, in ancient times, I'm not sure if they still do it to this day, uh, where they would put this sort of mechanism on the necks of animals, whether it's a donkey and a bull, and it would attach the animal to whatever the animal was carrying along. And it would also attach the animals together. So it was a mechanism that would bind animals together and then connect them to whatever they're carrying, maybe a car carrier to whatever they're, they're, they're pulling for. And for them to be unequally yoked would be the instance of one of the animals being much stronger than the other animal and thus making it difficult for them to do what they are trying to accomplish together because one is holding them back. So it's like if you and I were trying to lift a couch and you are significantly weaker than myself and we're trying to move along and you're so weak that you're holding us back, right? We, we travel maybe five steps and you, your legs are shaking, you can't hold the couch. Me, I'm, me, I'm not struggling because I'm much stronger than you perhaps, right? And I'm moving along, but you're, you're, you're holding us back because of your weakness. That's what being unequally yoked means is that when two people are trying to pursue to attain something, one of them not having the capacity to do so is holding the other back. And so Paul says, don't find yourself in relationships in which you are being pulled back by an unbeliever. Now, there has to be an objective at hand for us to understand the scripture. There's something that we must be doing that makes it difficult for us to do if we are doing it or trying to accomplish it with the influence of an unbeliever in our life. And the objective he's talking about is Christ-likeness. The ultimate objective of every believer is to endeavor to become like the Christ fully, to become the perfect man, his spiritual maturity, to become like God. That was the entire objective of God even creating mankind. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. He wants to create a creature that looks like him and functions like him. That is the ultimate objective of mankind, is to create a creature, is for God to reproduce himself. It's the mystery of godliness that God can manifest himself in the flesh. And so if a Christian is pursuing to be Christ-like, it is impossible to do so if you are bound together with an individual that does not have that same pursuit. They're going to be holding you back. There are only two directions to go to, towards God and away from God. If someone is not born again, they are following Satan. And, you know, we say these things and it's, it's a tough thing for people to hear. Oh, but they're good people. You know, truth is offensive in this postmodern world, right? Uh, if an individual is a biological male and they feel like they're a female and you call them a male, they call it hate speech. But you're just saying the reality. It's like calling a cat a cat or a fish a fish. You're just calling a thing what it is. If someone's a male, they're a male, right? But we live in a world now where truth is offensive. It's not, well, it's not a new thing, but it's becoming more prevalent to the public eye now. It's becoming something that is very, it's becoming the norm. It's becoming very normative for that to be a thing where people have to disclose their beliefs because it might offend people and be tagged as hate speech and whatever the case may be. But 
uh, and believers have also gone into this thing where we're afraid to, to say the truth. The idea is that uh, anybody who is not born again is being led by Satan. The Bible says the prince of this world, Satan, is at work of them in them, uh, namely the children of disobedience. I'm going to read it from Ephesians chapter um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, oh, for, I'll read from verse 1 and then go to verse 2. In you, and you were dead, speaking to the Christian, and the Christian was dead in their offenses and sins, in which we previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That is the unbelievers. So Satan is at work in people opposed to God. He's at work in the unbelievers. Now, if, if there are two spirits primarily operating in the lives of men, uh, there's one classification of people who are being led by Satan, one classification of people who are being led by God. Um, if God and Satan do not agree, how can the people following the two agree? It's like playing for two different, uh, being in two different armies. If the generals of those two armies, the leaders of those two armies are enemies, if everyone following those two leaders are faithful to the leader, they're going to also be enemies. If two leaders are opposed to each other, the followers of those two leaders, if they're following that leader faithfully, they'll also be opposed to each other. If Christ and Satan are opposed, how can someone following Christ and someone following Satan be best friends? Think about it. It would only be possible if Christ and Satan are, are Christ and Satan best friends. They're not best friends. They're opposed. They're adversary. Satan is, that's not even his name. His name is Lucifer. The name Satan literally means the enemy. It's the adversary, the enemy, the one that opposes us. He is our enemy. And those that follow him, uh, I wouldn't say in a sense that they're our enemy, but they are, they are, we have not made them our enemies, but they themselves, because of the, their following of Satan, have made themselves or are born enemies of God. In fact, I should even say it this way. We're not even, we don't choose to become enemies of God. We're born enemies of God. That's a better way to say it. Because the Bible says we're by nature children of wrath. Our nature, that first nature, that Adamic nature, that, that fallen human nature is opposed to God. The Bible says in Romans chapter, or in the book of Romans, that the carnal mind, the human, the natural fallen mind is opposed to God. It's an enemy of God, naturally. So your natural disposition, when you're born into the world, you are naturally an enemy of God. It's only until God reconciles you to himself through Christ and the cross that you can now become a friend of God. And so how can somebody following Christ and somebody following Satan walk together? Now, I know you will say, okay, but how are they following Satan? It's not as if they're living such an evil life. Following Satan is not necessarily, is not necessarily living such an immoral life per se. Understand that Satan's goal is not to get you to necessarily... Uh, serve him in the sense of you are deliberately choosing to do what Satan wants you to do. No, Satan's objective is you to just do whatever you want to do as long as it's not what God wants you to do. Satan is not trying to rule your life. I know we always say that, but technically that's not really the objective. His objective is for you to honestly be ruled by whatever you want to be ruled by as long as it's not God. It can be yourself. It can be ambition. It can be the flesh. It can be sex. It can be anything. Satan is not... He's not, he's not necessarily seeking for you to acknowledge him as your God. He wants you to acknowledge anything else but God as your God, right? You see, so, see, so his goal is idolatry. He wants you to, to worship everything else or anything else but God. And so somebody who's following Satan is not necessarily that they wake up and say, I worship Satan. No, no, no. It's somebody that's not worshiping God. If they're not worshiping God, they're automatically doing Satan's will. And what is Satan's will? For them to not worship God. God's will is for you to obey him. Satan's will is for you to disobey him. Disobeying him is a big playing ground. Disobeying God means doing everything else but what God says to do. So it's a big playing ground, right? And so uh, uh, following after Satan, I know it sounds like I'm saying that, oh, you wake up and say, I worship. It's not waking up and say, I worship Satan. It's waking up and not choosing to worship God is worshiping Satan. I know it sounds, but that's what it is. Because Satan's objective is not... Uh, a very defined objective. His government is an anti-government. He doesn't actually have an agenda of his own. His agenda is to make sure that people don't follow God. That's, it's just a very broad agenda. So if God says go left, 
He doesn't just want you to go right. He wants you to go up, down, anywhere else but left. His objective is just to find out what God wants men to do and have men do anything else but that thing. You see that now. And so even if you're following money, Satan's fine. If your God is money, Satan is fine. If your God is sex, Satan's fine. If your God is self, Satan's fine. If your God is sports, Satan's fine. If your God is food, Satan's fine. As long as your God is not the true God, it doesn't matter to him. So those people who are not following God, who are living and pursuing anything else, even if it seems like a good thing, if they're pursuing and worshiping anything else but God, it could even be religion, it could even be ministry, it can be marriage, it can be anything that is the number one place in their life, the number one place in their heart, the object of their worship, the object of the pursuit. And if that thing is not God, Satan is pleased and you're doing his bidding and you're following after him. You're doing what he wants you to do, which is to do everything else but what God says to do. You have to understand this. And so how can those two people walk together? The person who is following God specifically and the person who is following anything else. They may not wake up and say, I'm serving Satan, but they're, they're not serving God. That's the idea. They're not serving the true God. They're not waking up and doing what God has sent them in the world to do. They're doing whatever they want to do. And Satan is fine with that. They're following after the pleasures of their heart. They're doing what they're ambitious to do. And that's not how Christians ought to live. Jesus said, my, my bread is to do the will of him that sent me. And if we're following Jesus, we're going to live the same way. We're not doing what we feel like doing. You see that now. If a man is, 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 is engaging in ministry, he's not doing this thing because he just feels like doing it. He's doing it because God says so. But if a person who doesn't know God is doing what they want to do. And I can really go deep into that, but I don't, I don't want to make this too long. And so... The reason why they're unequally yoked is because if someone is pursuing to obey God and someone else is pursuing to obey everything else, how can they walk together? Their objectives are different, right? His ambition can be to become a global superstar, whatever his ambition is. But this man's ambition is very simple, is to do whatever God says to do. He doesn't have a clearly defined objective, yet it is defined by God. He doesn't have an objective that he defines for himself. His objective is defined by God. Jesus said, I come to do the will of him that sent me. They say, I've come to do something. No, no, no. I've come and I'm a blank sheet of paper. Whatever I'm going to do is going to simply be what God tells me to do. That's the born again man's perspective. But the person that's not born again doesn't know God, doesn't believe in God. So they can't do what God says to do. They can do whatever they want to do. And Satan doesn't care what they do as long as it's not what God wants them to do. So Satan is not telling them to do anything specifically. Just do whatever you want, but don't do what God says. And so that's why Satan is able to promote this false sense of liberality. He wants to liberate you from God's bondage. He wants to make it seem as if he's the one liberating man. Oh, forget this God that wants to make you do what he wants. Do what you want. That's the first law of Satanism is do what thou wilt. Do what you want. That's what Satan doesn't care what you do as long as it's not what God wants you to do. So if you want to pursue money, go ahead. Satan say, go ahead. Pursue women, go ahead. Pursue sex, go ahead. Pursue money, go ahead. Pursue whatever, fame, fortune. Go ahead. As long as you're not pursuing God, it's not my business. But God is very specific. He wants you to pursue him. He wants you to obey him. And Satan makes that seem as if, see, God's trying to bind you. He wants to enslave you. I want to free you. But true liberty without regulation is chaos. There's a thin line between chaos and liberty. Liberty is not doing what you want to do. Liberty is being free to do what God wants you to do. He told the Israelites or told Pharaoh, free my people, liberate them, that they might serve me. Liberty is having the, uh, uh, is choosing to serve God. Being a free man is a man that chooses to obey God. Because in that obedience, you will experience the liberties of the spirit. Your freedom from that which wants to bind you and separate you from God. That's bondage. But the idea is that you're going to be bound by either God or Satan. But there's a good kind of slavery and a bad kind of slavery. I know that sounds weird because we have a negative connotation on slavery and we should in the cultural context. But in the spiritual context, there's no such thing as a free man. Everyone is a slave to something. Whether So you're either a slave to God or a slave to anything else. But when you're a slave to God, you're free from the bondage of being separated from God. Because not knowing God is is the greatest ailment of, of, that can happen to a man is to not know God. Because every blessing provided for the human condition is inside the context of knowing God. Everything that makes up for a whole human life is in the context of knowing God. I don't want to diverge into many different things. I want to stay on topic here. We're talking about being unequally yoked. And so, you know, uh, 
You have to be equally yoked. James chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, You adulteresses, do you know not, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility or enmity toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself, makes himself. See, when you weren't a believer, you didn't make yourself an enemy of God. You were born an enemy of God. But you can be a believer and make yourself an enemy of God. Why? By choosing to walk with those who are opposed to him. You're joining the other team. So there are two teams. Satan is the leader of the team of darkness. Christ is the leader of the team of light. And you're choosing to go fellowship with the people who are in the team of darkness. You're, you're, you're going on the opposing team. Those that don't serve God. Those that don't worship God. They worship everything else. And he says when you do that, when you become a friend of those in the world, you're becoming an enemy of God. And so in fact... Being unequally yoked negatively impacts your relationship with God. Because adulterous means somebody who's faithless to God. It literally means a whore. Because uh, like how a woman can be unfaithful to the husband. You know, uh, you know, an adulteress, someone who's faithless, they're not faithful to their, to their spouse. And so you're choosing not to be faithful to Christ and choosing to, 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 to join the opposing team. And so the Bible is very clear on this um, as far as uh, friendship with those in the world is concerned. Um, that if a man is following Christ, that it should be extremely difficult for him to follow or if you know, impossible for him to walk with. Because when we say friend now, we're not talking about an associate. We're going to get into that in the next lesson of of. of, of uh, how we have loosely defined friendship. I'm not talking about somebody you work with. I'm talking about someone. A friend is a covenant relationship. It's somebody that you have made an agreement with that you will walk in this life together. And the problem with that, or well, it can be negative or positive, is that you will have a mutual influence on each other. The Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man does to his friend. When you have a friend, it is a mutually beneficial relationship in which you influence each other. Right, and so if you choose to be friends with somebody, it's a relationship in which you are at risk of that person influencing your lifestyle. So a friend is only the person, uh, I'm not talking to people who you work with, I'm talking to people who have the power to influence how you live your life. You see that now, a friend, a covenant relationship, somebody you've chosen to walk in life with. He says that, do, do not allow that friend to be an unbeliever because they're going to negatively impact your life. They're going to make you an enemy of God. You see that now. You're going to be getting to pursue the things that those which are in the world are pursuing, which is everything else but God. Everything else but doing God's will. It's just doing your own will. And doing your own will may not even be a bad thing. But everything that's good is not necessarily God. You see that now. Because you can do something good uh, self-servingly. right? The good that we do is supposed to be in service to God, not in service to ourselves. Because that means ultimately still you're doing something that's, that's good for you. You're serving yourself. The good that we do is not supposed to be for ourselves. It's supposed to be in service to God. You see, the Bible says whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. And everything we do, it's God that's supposed to receive the glory. It's Him we're doing it for. So we don't do good things for ourselves to make us feel good. That's self-righteousness. We do things to please God. You see that now? I'm going to end here. So that we can enter into the third lesson.